today we have Miss Marianne Marchetta with us today. She is an author, as you guys know, and she lived in this area for about 10 years. So we're really excited to have her today. So I guess let's get started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. I see lots of friendly faces. Some of you are just waking up like I am. So don't worry about that. Um, I guess we have an arrangement where you all are going to ask questions of me and I'm just going to answer whatever you want to know. So let's wait for this next group to come in. How many are from the writing club? Okay, well. So there's, there's about eight people. Okay. And the rest are just the reading class. Very good. Nice to see you all this morning. And once we get everybody seated and situated, we'll, uh, we'll get started. I don't have control of that one, so. There's a, there's a... How do you ladies want to uh, do this? Who's first? We only have, you want to start with the writing club questions? We'll go ahead and do that. Um, the writing club came up with a list of questions, not a lot of them. But they were great um, questions. Well, and Emma is going to kind of, kind of um, go through the questions. So you can start with the first one and then okay, then, great. Then Thanks, Emma. from there. Your Marchetta motto seems to be vintage storytelling in a modern world. What exactly do you mean by that? Is it just historical fiction or does it refer to something more? Well, there's actually two things that it stands for. And one is, yes, historical fiction. And the other is the style of my writing. I like to make my writing a throwback more to like the Charles Dickens kind of stories where it's actually a story, not so much an expose of something. You're going to look towards an ending and you have a definite plot. It's more of a style of writing for me. Your focus seems to be on historical fiction. Have you written other genres or is historical fiction your favorite genre? Um, okay. I know I had to write these answers down because this hour in the morning, as I told you, I'm not too good. Um, yes, uh, I have written in other genres, but those were not published because they were so bad. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but my next book is going to be a little more contemporary, so I think you all might enjoy that one. Uh, but I do like historical fiction. I like going back in time to the Edwardian era, era the turn of the 1900s, because my grandparents were teenagers then. I know I'm dating myself here, guys. Um, and I also like the 1930s, the 1940s. That's when my parents were growing up. And there was so much happening in the world at that point. If I have to choose another era that I like, it would probably be the 1960s and 70s, because that's when I was a young person. So yeah, I guess in retrospect, historical fiction is my thing. The beach is your happy do you write there, or do you write about the beach? I want to know who told you that. <laughs> Your website told that. <laughs> very good, very good. I'd like to see some people went out there. Um, it is my happy place. It's a quiet place. It gives me um, a calm place to think. And when the water, you sit by the water listening to the waves come in, it's kind of like white <clears throat> noise. And it blocks the world out, lets you think. I don't necessarily write at the beach, but I write near the beach. One of my favorite things to do for vacation is to go on a cruise. And I can do eight to ten chapters in a week on a cruise. Just because I'm on the water, it's peaceful, and it's quiet. And the other part of that was, do I write about the beach? Okay. You'll have to read my next book. It's all about the beach deals with mermaids and pirates. And it's set in a town not unlike Gulf Breeze. Okay. 
Do you have any children? If so, what effect have they had on your writing? Inspiration or someone just to write for? Unfortunately, I don't have any children. And I like to think of all of you as extended family, so that would count. Um, I do have nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews, so I write a lot for them in mind because I want them to be able to enjoy my stories. I like to be able to write something that they can learn from, a little bit about the past, maybe something they can use in the future, and somewhere along the line, way, way back, I'm going to go back like 40 years ago, when my, my oldest niece was just born, I started to write some children's stories, but they're still in a vault, and I won't take them out right now. <laughs> um, do you do read-alouds with your book? Does it depend on the age of your audience? I do read-alouds when I'm asked. And it doesn't matter so much the age of the audience as making the content of what I'm reading appropriate for the age group, okay? I'm not going to read something to you guys that I would read to a senior citizen, for example. I mean, you would have no interest in it, okay? So, yeah, I do them. I do them. Um, when asked. Thank you. Okay. All right, we just signed up. You want to start this one? Okay. Uh, oh. what in, okay, who or what inspired you to start writing books? Well, I have to say that as a young kid, um, first grade, I was a, a good reader then. I had, my parents were both heavy readers. They got me into that habit. And I thought, gee, how neat it would be if I could do something like this. And from then on, I was hooked, trying to write poetry, trying to write short stories, crappy ones, admittedly, um, at that age. But hey, you know, you got to start somewhere. Uh, what was the other half of that question? Oh, who or what inspired you to start writing? Okay, um, for inspiration, I have to say, uh, to start writing as an adult, my best friend Helen, she's been my friend now for about 35 years, and she's an, another reader like I am, and she looked at me one day and said, you know what, you can write a better story than this one that we just read, and I said, you know, you're right, and <laughs> so that was 201 Atwater. Okay, who's got the next one? Uh, who or what inspired you for the characters of your books? <clears throat> oh, okay, that's an easy one. People. People I meet. Family. Friends. Sometimes students at Woodlawn Beach. Um, places I've gone to. Things I've seen. Subjects I'm interested in. Oh, was there a second part to that one? Did I miss that? No, they didn't ask. Oh, sorry. If one of your books were made into a movie, who would play the leading roles? Oh, that would be a good question because, hmm, which one should we make into a movie first? <laughs> Do any of you know producers? <laughs> no? Anybody related to a producer or a director? <laughs> Please? Um, I'd probably let the producers and the casting crew choose who's going to play the parts because I'm hoping they would discover unknown talent, somebody great would come out of it. And who knows, by the time they're ready to do that, maybe one of you all could star in a movie. Okay, who's got the next question? Okay. Um, when you were growing up, what kind of books? Did you enjoy, and what were your favorites? Mostly fiction. I like fiction. Um, to me, nonfiction is okay if you're trying to learn something, but, you know, for pure pleasure, I like fiction, so I like to get escape. My favorites when I was a young girl are Heidi and Bambi, and I still own the books that my mother bought me from a used, uh, a used bookseller. At that time, they were a quarter for a hardcover. Um, of course, it doesn't even pay for shipping these days, as you know. Um, as I grew older, Gone with the Wind, To Kill a Mockingbird, two of my favorites, perennial favorites. I think I've read Gone with the Wind at least six times. 
because I love the drama and the sweep and the feel of getting into the characters. And who can who can not love Scarlett O'Hara? She is a character and a half, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. I think I got that one covered. Okay. Have you ever read anything that made you think differently about fiction? Um. Yeah. I had I had to think about that question for a long time because I almost didn't think anything did. But after I started writing, I read a Stephen King book called On Writing where he talks about his experiences, his life experiences, and about becoming an author and the difficulties that he overcame in getting his work accepted, making it good enough. And then he also talks about, in the end, the joy of having his work accepted and widely read. He's not, I mean, of course, anybody at that level's in it for the money, but at the beginning, he wasn't. He was just trying to make a living and trying to express his inner self. And I think that's what comes through. And that's what you want to have come through. What was your first published piece of writing and how was it different? I mean, and how difficult was it to get it published? Okay, my first one was 201 Atwater <coughs> that was published. And it was very difficult to get it published. Um, back then, you didn't have the self-publishing venues that you have now, like Create Space or some of the others that, the vanity houses, they call them, the indie publishing. So by the time you go through getting your manuscript rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected, um, then you try looking at agents to get your manuscript submitted to publishing companies. And writing the book is not the hardest thing you'll find in publishing. It's getting your book into the hands of an agent who's willing to accept it to try to get it published. You have to write a synopsis. You have to write a query letter. And all of that is very difficult when you're trying to express your entire book in 500 words or less. It's like, how do I do this? Where do I start? So it's a big process, and that's why I chose eventually to go to the Create Space platform, where as long as you have a well-edited manuscript, you can publish it for almost free. And you will then retain a little bit more of the royalties. But still, it's a long process, and it's an involved process. There's a lot more than just putting the words to paper. Okay? How did it, my first book? Okay. Okay, it made me aware of the intricacies involved, like I was just saying but also more involved in learning to write the details and writing for the reader, okay? It's one thing to write for yourself and get your thoughts out and your words down, but when you reread it, reread it not as the writer, but as a reader. If you were to just go into the library and pick up this manuscript that you just wrote, how does it sound to you? Is it cohesive? Are the details there? Is there something that you're referring to that you know you're referring to, but your reader has no idea what you're saying? So you want to make sure that everything is understandable. And that's what I kind of learned after the first book. Okay, who's got another one? Other than writing, what other hobbies do you do? Oh, well, that's pretty fun. Reading, as you can tell. Um, I also like to travel with my husband, and by traveling we learn a lot that we incorporate into the books. I like to garden, and I also love to cook. How do you overcome writer's block? Okay, that's a fun one, because some days I've got writer's block, some weeks I've got writer's block for a week on end or more. So what I do is I take what I've written, and I look at it, and I reread it, 
and I try to edit it and make it a little bit better. And sometimes as I get to the end of what I've written, I'll go, oh, okay. And then they go on and you start writing from there, okay? Um, and always try to read something or research something that you know could be adding to your book or adding to another area that you might be interested in or another idea or explore another idea that might kick you back to this one. So there's always something that you can be doing. Okay? How long does it take you to write a book and how long is the editing process? Ah, okay. I think there are a lot of people who might be interested in this question, right? Okay, rough draft. I, ha I had to write this down and break it down, so please excuse me while I look at my notes. I can do a, a rough draft in about six to seven months of a two to three hundred page book. That's the end of the first thing. That's when your work starts. Okay? Um, and before you even write your rough draft, if it's something you're not too sure about, if it's something you want to know more about to make sure you're correct and get your facts correct. You want to do some planning and some research. So I would allow about two months for that, even before you put pen to paper, unless you're just writing notes to yourself. After you get your first draft, allow two to six draft edits. You're going to read the whole thing through, go through the first time, you know, looking for your... Um, for your grammar mistakes, because there are going to be grammar mistakes in a rough draft. Everybody does it, you know, even even the most well-known author in the world doesn't get it right the first time. So what you want to do is go through and look at that. Then you start to read it and go, okay, how can I make this paragraph better? How can I make this sentence better? Do I have too many pronouns? Who am I referring to? Are my timelines correct? Are my facts correct? For example, you're not going to have a gentleman on his way to work in 1920 stop at Starbucks for his coffee. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. They didn't have a Starbucks back then. And they might not even have taken coffee to work. I don't know. They probably had a coffee pot. Um, but stuff like that. You want to make sure your characters are dressed for the time that you're setting them in. Um, just get the little details right. So then you go through, you make your edits, you come back, you reread the whole thing. Go through it again, go through it again, get your typos taken care of. And then when you think you have a perfect manuscript, I want you to put it in the drawer or in a closet or leave it in your computer and walk away from it for a month. And I want you to come back with fresh eyes and look at it and read it to yourself aloud. Read it aloud. Because I have noticed myself, after six edits, I pick it up and I start reading and I go, Second sentence, oh my God, what was I thinking? And you start all over again. But that's going to be the fine-tuning, if you wish. The, the littlest details. You want it right. You want your audience, your readers, to be able to pick it up and say, wow, that was great. And if they don't, well, then you failed. Okay? Um, so, with the final draft, another two weeks, and I'm going to say about 18 to 19 months total from start to finish. You'll have a book. Okay. Anybody else? What is your favorite book you've written? Favorite book I've written? Oak Cliff. I mean, I like all of my books because they all have a little bit of me or some part of me in them. But Oak Cliff, because it's a departure for me, they're my happy, happy books. It's a little bit dark, it's a little bit more twisted, and it was a stretch of my imagination. And, as someone asked me earlier, I think it was Faye, if there's any secrets in my books, yes there are, and in that one, which deals with several different families living in the same house, one family is based on myself and my parents from my childhood. You just have to figure out which one. Okay. Although your books are fiction, are there some elements of nonfiction as well? Okay. 
Uh, well, as I just told you, that one in Oak Cliff. But yes, I like to include <coughs> some historical facts in my books, true historical facts or historical settings. Um, I like to base some of my characters on real people or have my characters interact with a historical figure. So there would be some real life stuff in my books. Yes. I'm sorry? Do you have any pets? Do I have any pets? Yes. I currently have two cats. Um, I have a six-year-old, Gray and Hoy. Her name is Taffy, and she's my chief editor because she loves to sit on my keyboard and put her paws up on my screen. And I have a very large orange tabby named Macho Kitty, who's three years old, and he is the boss of the house. He's very macho. guys. <laughs> well, how about we just take some other questions if anybody has any. I want to know more about your new book, The Mermaids. Oh, the all right. Well, let me explain a little bit more about that. Um, right now, a working title is called The Crystal Mermaid, and it's going to be set in this area because, as I said, you still live up here, so why not? It's a beautiful spot. People should know about it. And it's going to deal with an 11 or 12 year old <coughs> young boy who um, is met by a mermaid somewhere maybe over <coughs> East Bay or Pensacola Bay or somewhere like that. Of course, we're not going to use the real town names. You know, we don't want the towns coming after us. So um, he's going to meet a mermaid who tells him, this is going to be set sort of in the 1970s, he's going to learn about the decline of the coral reefs in our in our oceans and a lot of that being caused by global warming, pollution, toxic waste and all of that. And she's going to ask his help. But along the way he's going to meet some pirates. Hmm. And he'll have to deal with a certain pirate who thinks his little mermaid is just the perfect little thing and wants her for his own. So that's going to be kind of like the romance part of it for the girls. Yeah, but the pirates, we'll, we'll get into them guys too. And in the meantime, he grows up and becomes, you know, a doctor, a, a scientist, who then begins to deal with the coral reefs, and he's working towards helping it, it out. I haven't quite gotten the whole idea together yet, but that's going to be the basis of it. So we're going to try to do a little bit of, of learning and teaching about science with it, Along the fun way, have some fun and a little fantasy. So, based on your timeline, we should see it in a year and a half? Mm, roughly. <laughs> I, I've got four pages written, but I'm like, um, hmm, don't like them that much. So, of course, we're going to change them. And I need to, ah, here's where some of you can help me out. I need a name for my, my young man. Tommy. Okay, I need a, a, a last name too. Um, Nicholson. Tommy Nicholson. Tommy Nicholson. Tommy Nicholson. Tommy Nicholson. Tommy Nicholson. I was Good thinking deal. of my. I was thinking of my dad. <laughs> okay. Um, Tommy, Nicholson, Nicholson. Tommy Nicholson sounds pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tommy Nicholson, it is. And I've got, I will tell you the name of my villain. His name is Crimlo. I picture him as kind of like a scaly creature who lives underwater with a big hook nose and maybe some seaweedy kind of hair. Yes. Do you put any like pictures in your books? I wish I could draw. I can't, honey. I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, yes. No. You think it was your question? No. We're we're good. Uh. Okay. Um. When you write your books, do you have a certain age group in mind? If so, what what age group is it? In this particular case, yes. I'm, I'm writing it for middle age, um, I mean middle age, oh God, no, I'm sorry kids, I really, <laughs> middle school and above, okay? Um, I normally write for that age group, middle school and above, 
but my Bridgewater series is more adult. And that's one of the reasons I haven't given it to you here. I expect you'll be able to read it and, and get more out of it after you're in high school. Um, but right, right now, I think these books are, are great for you guys. So, yeah, I, I don't particularly hit one age. Well, one age group is my family memories is probably more geared to someone my age because they can identify with what I experienced when I grew up. But I thought it might be interesting for you folks, too, because you can learn about a different time period. Yes? Um, what inspired the name for your book, 201 at Water? That's actually based on my husband's parents' house. Um, their house is very old. It's about 100 years old. And every time we'd sit down for Sunday dinner with, with his folks, there's one window... Yes, it's a stained glass window that goes over the stairwell. And I always thought, gee, you know, there's got to be a story behind that. There's got to be a story behind that. And then there's a built-in china closet that's been there for like years and years. And I thought, I wonder what this history would have been like if people lived in this house. And so I created a history for it. That's all. Uh, okay. Lady. Is that their house? Is the picture on the cover? No, it's not. But I'm going to be reissuing the book in another year because I'm going to add to it and correct a lot of the mistakes that are in it that since that was my first book. And I am going to put a picture of the actual house. Now that they no longer own it and nobody can find it that knows them, they've since passed on, so we're going to put the picture on it. I've got a gentleman back here. How did you come up with the name of 201 Atwater? Actually, the house is on Atwater Street. And rather than put the actual street address, because they were living in the house at the time, I used the number of the vacant lot next to them. <laughs> yes, um, in general, um, for all of your books, how do you come up with their names? Okay, well, let's take them. Um, Valley Memories was easy. That was the name of the newspaper column that I wrote. And I wrote a column once a month for a paper back north. And it was just whatever I wanted to say about my growing up. And so the column was named Valley Memories. I lived in the Valley. Um, so I just took the name and put it on the book. For Honeysuckle Hill, I just loved the name Honeysuckle. I just love Honeysuckle. And I said, oh, the story is going to be set on that hill over there because it's where I used to go down to the state park, so I just called it Honeysuckle Hill. And it deals with the honeysuckle. If you've read it, you'll know there's a honeysuckle shrub that goes through it. Um, Oak Cliff is actually the name of the cemetery that's on the cover. That picture was taken by my cousin. He lives across the street from the cemetery. That is a Civil War cemetery, and it's real. It's there. Every time I go to his house, I see it. And some days he just calls me up and goes, Hi, I'm looking at your book cover. <laughs> and he's looking out of his front door. Um, for Bridgewater Holidays, that's just part of the other series that is not here. But this one was, uh, again, a throwback to a lot of different time periods that I thought you all might be interested in. Okay. I noticed that most of your books, at least the large series, are the Bridgewater Chronicles. I know you said that that's more for Well, yeah, and, and the reason I say that is because there are some scenes that um, I'm sure your parents would object to. So, but I can give you a little overview of it. Um, it's, it's, how do I want to say this? It's a family saga. It covers the inception of a dynasty, an American dynasty. Well, if y'all know Downton Abbey, I kind of call it my American Downton Abbey. Um, a lot of intrigue, a lot of uh, family dysfunction, if you will. Uh, I have old Boston family, old money, and then I have a new New York family who's worked their way up from poverty and immigration to have their own, you know, by the fingernails, they've earned their money. And they, they marry and start their own dynasty. And I've said it in a vintage town in Connecticut. 
and it deals with their offspring and their offspring and their offspring. And the last book um, in it, I don't know if we have, do we have time to, 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 if I could do a little bit of uh, a, a reading from that? Ten minutes left. Okay, I, I do have my Kindle. I don't know if I can connect to Wi-Fi in here. Kenneth?